Welcome to the Private Practice Startup, where we inspire you from startup to mastery. We chat with entrepreneurs, experts in the mental health and business arenas, and successful private practitioners to give you the tools needed to make your dream practice a reality. Visit theprivatepracticestartup.com for awesome resources, free trainings, and so much more. Here are your hosts, Dr. Kate Campbell and Katie Lemieux. Well, hi and hello, Startup Nation. This is Katie Lemieux, and I am here with my fantastic and amazing co-host. What's up, guys? It's Kate Campbell. We are super glad you are here hanging with us today, wherever you are. I don't know. Maybe you're on a vacation. Maybe you're laying in bed, Taking showering. A I don't know. That's why I listen to work. things. Uh, but we're glad to have you. So we had an awesome show last week with Amy Crane of Social Lab Marketing, and we talked a ton about Facebook ads. You guys are always asking about online marketing, and our topic today is about online marketing as well. And so we have Phil Singleton, and he is from Kansas City Web Design, and we are going to jump into the blue ocean of Florida and do a deep dive into SEO for private practitioners. But before we get started, if you're a first-time listener, we want to say welcome. We are rolling out the virtual red carpet for you, and we have a special gift for you. We want you to head over to privatepracticestartup.com, go to the resources tab, and download our A to Z cheat sheet, the essentials for building and growing your dream practice. So we have tons of tips, ideas, thoughts, all from A to Z. There's more than one in each actually. So it's really going to help you get started and or grow your practice. But before we do that, we wanted to just hear a quick note from our sponsor. Today's sponsor is from the private practice startup, attorney approved private practice paperwork. That's a tongue twister, right? Uh, you guys love what you do, making a difference in the world as clinicians, and we want to make sure that you're able to continue doing just that by not leaving yourself open and your private practice open to having legal issues. Knowing that you need to have legal, ethical, comp- uh, and competent, comprehensive paperwork can be really overwhelming and time-consuming and not to mention super expensive with high attorney's fees. So Katie and I, uh, over a decade ago, realized that this was something that clinicians like ourselves struggled with. And we wanted to make sure that we provided a solution for you. So we put in all of the work. We paid thousands of dollars to multiple attorneys and took care of all of that so you don't have to worry about it. There's enough with building a practice and growing a practice to not have to worry about wasting your time and energy on this. So make sure to check out our packages and a la carte paperwork items that are over on our website privatepracticestartup.com. Head over to the shop tab and there you'll be able to see the a la carte paperwork. And on that page, we actually are giving you a form for free. It's an attorney approved HIPAA form for free. So make sure to download your copy. And yeah, so it's a really exciting sponsorship. So Phil, how are you? Welcome. I'm doing great. I'm jealous that you guys are in Florida, although I know it's cool. It's so cool down there. It might not be as jealous as I normally would be, but... <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess I feel bad for the people vacationing, you know, and they have one week of vacation and they came on the coldest week of the year. You know what? That's the funniest thing because, I, you know, here I am driving down. I was driving down the beach. I've got my boots on. I've got my leather jacket on, my sweater. I'm like all bundled up and I see all these people in bathing suits. I'm like, they must be Canadians or for somewhere like really cold and they think this is beautiful weather to lay out and like actually get in the water. What, like, what is that thing? What? The polar bear, like oh, where, where you go in the freezing cold water and ice plunge or whatever that is. There you go. Yeah, not going to be in my repertoire. Definitely. Did anybody even bother trying to cover stuff? Is it that cold or did just people, like <laughs> wrapping all their shrubs up and stuff like that? Actually, we were talking about the falling iguanas um, earlier before we pushed record, <laughs> and people will actually put heating heating pads and heating blankets out on their docks down here to save the iguanas and the iguanas come and like lay on the heating pads and that makes sure that they save them. You will not find the heating pads on my dock. (laughs) (laughs) Only in Florida. Florida. So if you really love iguanas and you're coming to travel down, bring a heating pad so you can help save the iguanas. (laughs) That that should be a t-shirt, like an iguana laying, no, but an iguana laying on a heating pad. You know, I don't know, with a scarf in the sun or something like that. (laughs) All right. So this is not an iguana deep dive. This is an SEO deep dive. So get down to it. (laughs) it. Tell us how you got involved in this line of work. Well, it's kind of interesting. I took a like a non traditional path to digital marketing. I went to school and studied finance and business. um, Rolled out of college into an exciting career in insurance. Um, and about the third or fourth year there, I just felt, you know, I was in a kind of a soul crushing cubicle job and I was like, <laughs> I can't, 
Do you, I mean, I'm sure I don't want to cry. I mean, a lot of people are in insurance and I'm sure that works for them. That's okay. Not our um, listeners. So it's fine. You're good. Right? So, but I was there and again, I was in my twenties, obviously coming out of, uh, out of school, but I just figured early on, like, this is not for me at the same time. It's like, you see people getting into these corporate jobs and, you know, for me, it was good money at the time. I was really thankful to be able to step out of um, college into a job because the market wasn't great when I got out, but it was like the third year in there. I was like, I can't do this anymore. Cause I'm looking around seeing the guys that have been there for 20 years plus, And they're kind of like corporate zombies. And I was like, this is not me. But at the same time, each year that goes by, you feel like you're starting to get pulled down somebody else's destiny almost. Um, so I did something radical, like on the course of like a two week period, I quit, I packed my bags and I moved to Asia just like oh. Went. What? I, Asia. You to say I, that. I know that was like a total like pattern to like, what? what? Tell us about that. So, Why? Asia? Yeah. So at the time, I mean, at the time it wasn't like cool or my, 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 you know, my family and friends didn't think I was like doing something exciting. They just basically thought I lost my mind and perhaps I was a little bit, um, but I want to do something different and drastic and burst out of the bubble that I was in. And basically looking back, I think I was just subconsciously trying to change the trajectory of my career path. And I, and I did so in a big way, but I moved out there, studied Chinese, um, met my eventual, eventual wife, uh, came back to the States, got an MBA and I got a job that took me right back there. So all told I was there for like 10 years. Um, but the very end of my stint there, I actually had essentially a software company fall into my lap and keep in mind here, I'm, you know, I didn't do my first website until after age 30. So I'm not like a digital native or anything like that. Um, but this job, this last job that I had in Taiwan is where I actually lived. That was kind of my home base moving around was a software company. And, um, this is going back like, you know, 15 years ago or so. And we were selling this company that basically fell into my lap as a result of kind of the dot com era bus that was there. Um, I started learning about, you know, web design and really a lot of the sales that we were coming, that we're, we're selling in this company, um, we're coming from Google. Again, 15 years ago, people were looking stuff up. They'd go to a website. They'd click on a banner link, go to our website. And we'd sell them a software for $99. But we would give half of that sale and commission away to an affiliate marketer. Mm-hmm. Wow. And, I, and to me, I was like, well, wait, this doesn't make a lot of sense. But I, I, I just because we got 50% of, say, a $100 sale. And the other guys got 50, the big affiliate marketers. And here we had 25 employees product development. And I was like, you know, our little piece of the pie went down to nothing. And these guys were running their websites, forums, precursors to blogs. We were writing checks for like fifty, eighty thousand $80,000 a month. And I was like, well, wait a minute, this doesn't make a lot of sense. But as the finance side of me, I was like, okay, follow the ROI trail back to Google and online. I was like, okay, I see how this is happening and why these guys have so much power. Long story short, we ended up selling that company moving back to the States and Kansas city where I have roots. I told you guys I was, I consider myself from Florida cause I, I was in grade school and high school there, but my extended. Wait, 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 what happened to middle school? <laughs> uh, middle, well, middle school, sorry, middle school. Oh, okay. well you kind of said great. I was like, Oh, there might be another. I kind of lumped there. those together. I lumped those <laughs> got together. It, got it. Was, um, but you know, while I was in Florida, I went to college. My parents ended up moving back to Kansas city, which is there from my wife and I, when we visit, we come back here and she ended up loving you know the Midwest. So, Nice. We, in 2005, we moved back here and I didn't know really what I wanted to do or what I wanted to be. We sold this company. It was a nice payday, but it wasn't like I can do nothing for the next 40 years, 50 years of my life type of a thing. So I ended up doing one website on a barter trade with this auto detailer. I had no business doing it, never tried to build a website um, before. I did have some exposure to SEO and how Google worked, but I ended up making this ugly one page Microsoft front page website for this guy. Um, and 60 days later, after I built it, he calls me up. Literally, I could hear his voice cracking and the, hear like the tear running down his eye. He was like, I don't know what you've done. You've changed my business. You've changed my life. And I was like, man, that was like the most rewarding mm. thing that had ever happened to me. A guy, you know, I was in my early 30s at this time. Um, and I was like, wow, this is very powerful. Not only did I have the most rewarding professional experience I've ever had, I can make money at this. So did a couple more barter websites and it's kind of rolled into a thriving digital agency. Now I'm writing books and being on podcasts and, you know, doing all sorts of things. But again, I learned from the outside in. So I was like, one of these, you know, these guys that are coming up in it, they're doing graphic design and coding and all this kind of stuff <laughs> at birth or at least in high school, you know, in, in high school or, or college. Um, but I learned way after the fact and that's just proof to tell anybody. Now you can, you can, you can get in here, get your um, 
you know, hands dirty a little bit, learn some of this kind of stuff. And anybody can be a successful digital marketer, especially me. I got I t- in my little one sheet, I think I send you guys, I got a D in computer science. <laughs> so, you know, for a guy that makes his living and a good living at, at digital marketing after they almost flunking out of the class in college, um, it just shows that anybody can do this if they put their mind to it. <laughs> Yeah. And for private practitioners, digital marketing is key because so many people are going online and Googling, where can I find a therapist or I'm struggling with this. And so when, um, when you have a solid website and you're able to get the organic search engine optimization going, then you really set yourself up for success and you don't have to pay. You're not, it's not paid advertising it's the organic advertising, which is so, so, so important. Um, yeah. So tell us a little bit, cause not everybody knows about what SEO is. I know I just said search engine optimization, but tell us a little bit for the basic practitioner, what that is and why that's important. Well, I think, yeah, for, for us, SEO is any way you can, you know, get organic visibility for somebody that goes through a search engine. You know, when we say search engine, we're basically talking about Google cause they're the 800 pound gorilla and showing up on the first page somewhere on it, preferably towards the top, um, organically, so you're not having to pay for it. So there's lot, lots of ways onto the for, first page or more than there were um, there used to be. Um, certainly, if you're local, and it sounds like most of your listeners are, being able to really, to me, the holy grail of local SEO now is getting organic results, but also getting organic results into the, into the local map, the maps um, three-pack. And to the extent that you can, I know we talked about this kind of in the green room before the show, to the extent that you can get some kind of um, review or social proof up in that map being reviews, huge, huge benefit. That's what really makes the phone ring more than anyone else. Because if I'm searching for ABC practitioner or whatever vertical and I see them come up first, lots of credibility there. I see them come up with more reviews than anybody else. I'm definitely going to call these guys because the internet's saying that they're the best at what they do type of thing. So I know it can be a little bit tricky for this. And we talked about some ways that people may be able to accumulate some kind of review proof within still by maybe staying within, um, tighter guidelines that this industry has. And I have some ideas on that. You guys also had some, but um, certainly to me, like the Holy grail of SEO for anyone local right now is, is combining that kind of that online reputation with the organic visibility. And for clinicians, we have to make sure that we're not soliciting reviews from our clients or patients. Um, but a way to get around that, we were talking about this a little bit before we hit the record button, and a way to get around that is to ask your colleagues or professionals that you've collaborated with, whether it's another doctor or psychiatrist or pediatrician or um, school psychologist or attorney, whoever it is, asking people for those reviews, your clinicians, your colleagues, other professionals, because that will help to beef up your organic SEO and you're not asking your clients to put their identity at risk um, in order to do so. And of course, we talked about if somebody wants to do it on their own, there's really no way mm-hmm. anybody can stop mm-hmm. a patient from doing it. And we mm-hmm. see that all over the place. Um, and I actually, some places are some types of medical practices are definitely more aggressive than others Mm -hmm. because I know chiropractors go out and solicit reviews all the time. I know dentists do because we have dentists, but I'm sure there's certain areas where it's probably maybe more regulated or more looked upon and people have to kind of be more careful about um, how they do it. The question though I'd have, and this might be a little bit of work around, I have to ask you guys on this is could somebody solicit a review that's not necessarily on the type of um, medical service uh, that they're getting, but maybe on a piece of content or like say a book or something they're writing, right? So somebody writes a book and it gets up there and it's up on Amazon or whatever, or perhaps they've got a review funnel to say, Hey, we sent this out. Would you mind reviewing me at this link? And then you can send that link to wherever you want, Facebook or, or um, Google. Can somebody say, Hey, I read this book and Dr. So-and-so, this was a great book. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah, somebody so, can definitely review that as long as we're not like soliciting to clients. Like if I specifically send out a newsletter to my past clients, current clients and say, hey, read this book and can you give me a review? That would be solicitation. Um, but yeah, I mean, colleagues, friends, people like Kate was saying, people around if they read your book or whatever, um, asking for that later on is, is cool. I actually went to a doctor's appointment um, maybe like a month ago to a new doctor. I was transitioning and went to a new doctor and she was great. I had a great appointment with her and I came out afterwards. I saw the receptionist, you know, I was taking care of my bill and I said, gosh, it was so nice meeting Dr. So-and-so. I really appreciated how she spent so much time with me and blah, blah, blah. And she was like, oh, that's great. I'm so glad that you enjoyed. And actually, if you want to leave a review, 
here's an iPad. They had an iPad with like a whole review system. And as I was get leaving them a comment, I was like, you know what? Sure. I'll do that really quick. And I was like, wow, they were really smart to be able to do that. Like take care of it on the spot, but that's not something that we could do for clinicians. Right. Yeah. Tricky, but yeah, people are getting into it. Most of those ones that are actually going from like an iPad, you have to be careful, not careful. When I say careful, I'm meaning to me, really to make reviews count, they've got to be in places that are highly visible. And there's a lot of places um, that doctors or some doctors will use to collect reviews, but they end up being placed on like a third party proprietary system. So Mm -hmm. if I'm on somebody's like, there's some like customer lobby, a couple other ones where you collect reviews and you're getting reviews and you can do that from an iPad and a single location, put them up on this review site, but they don't, they're not, you're not able to get a review like on an iPad like that. And from one device in the same location, keep posting them, say they, to review to Google from different places. So the IP flag, address. They'll flag it. Yeah. And eventually you won't Oh, get that's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. interesting. So, so, that's so, interesting. so we're getting into a piece of this, like I was going to tell you guys about this other strategy, but reviews are really a huge part of it. And you asked what really counts locally and it's organic stuff. A lot of that comes back to the website and setting that up and, and, and making sure you get the right content on it, but somehow trying to crack that review because it sounds like if a lot of the folks that are listening are in the same boat where they can't solicit, they're probably not getting a ton of reviews. So a handful of reviews might actually pull you up into the maps. Yeah. And so share with the audience, like why are reviews, how is that related to SEO and why is that so important? Well, for one, it, in terms of Google and Google maps and that kind of stuff, that's one of the more important ranking factors. So they're going to actually look at because that's so that's proof, right? Somebody visited or went to you and they came and they said, these guys did a great job. Even if they didn't do a great job, they get some kind of review that actually establishes it is a real business. And the people that tend to have higher reviews are going to be the ones that are going to be pulled up into that map listing. So that helps you organically get a better shot um, into the maps when that pull, when people do a local search for that. It also helps to some degree, it's a ranking factor to pull up under the organic list as well. Because again, it's another trust factor. And a big thing with Google right now is trust. In fact, one of the things um, I'll, we'll talk to you guys about, and maybe even send you a link or people can look this up, but if you do a Google search for Google search evaluator guidelines or Google search quality guidelines, you'll see a 160 page um, book, ebook by Google that they, that they publicly make available because they've got an army of about 15,000 quality evaluators that actually go in and manually test results to check the quality of them. And inside that book, it's fascinating to me you can read about the way Google instructs these quality evaluators that are going to independent contractors to get about 15 bucks an hour for doing manual you know, quality checks. Um, it instructs them how to um, look for a quality website because again, they want to use the quality evaluators to make sure that their algorithms are serving up the right time to stuff. So they're actually giving you to me a cheat sheet on the, what you should be doing on your website to prove to the algorithms that you should be ranked. And inside this document that you read, Google just pounds these quality of value in the, in the trainers. They tell them, look for this acronym. They, they mention this acronym many times, EAT, Education, Authority, and Trust. That's what they want their algorithm to serve up. In the, and, and then they tell you within this document, here are the factors that you should look on a website to determine if they educate, if they're an authority website, and they can establish trust. So that one of the big things they talk about is reviews. Are they blogging? Are they showing a physical address? Do they show their pictures? Is it, is it evident on each page of the website who wrote the content? So there's, they give you this like map and these guidelines about when we look at a website, what we should be able to see in terms of the things on the website that, that indicate this kind of quality. And you know that if they're instructing these people to do this, that that's exactly what they're making. They're trying to automate and look for their algorithm. So to, that's what those are the things that you should focus on on your website. And trust factors, the reviews, are one of the things they explicitly say in this document to say, hey, look for reviews. Look for third-party web, you know, reviews. Look for the BBB. Look for um, independent, unbiased reviews from actual past clients or patients and this kind of stuff. So they're basically telling you this and they're not saying do this because we'll rank you, but it's implicit that that those are the things that they're using um, in terms of ranking factors. And the more we apply these to what the websites in the right way, we see them across a variety of different industries um, that they help increase the, the SEO rankings for just about everybody. So this is a major ninja tip because you have actually hacked the Google algorithms and you just shared that with our audience, Startup Nation, make sure you check that out. That's such an interesting acronym. So tell us how, give us some specific tips or examples of how to use that in positioning the content that you're putting on your website. So it sets you up for 
to be Googleicious. And and also, what is it that you need to say on those blogs and things like that? Like, what are the key phrases, keywords? How do you find those for your industry or, or I should say your ideal client? So in the first thing, I think to me, any, everything kind of comes back to your website. And we have to look at websites. I think this is one of the bigger mistakes that all small businesses make is they still kind of look at their website as digital brochures or some kind of a static place. But really, you have to think of it as an investment, as a marketing platform, and you have to invest in it in content in a way that's going to help you attract people organically. But also, you know, it's one thing to do a great job with SEO, but when people land on the website, if you're not showing those trust factors and those conversion factors, it ends up kind of becoming a waste. Um, when the good thing that Google's doing is they're kind of trying to merge that and they're telling people, we don't just want to have things to rank so people land on them. We want to show them the stuff that gets them to make the phone call or fill out the form or schedule an appointment. Um, so the first thing is to start looking at your website as an investment and probably as your most important investment that you have, because everything these days leads back to your website, whether you like it or not. I mean, people talk about like referral marketing. There's very few referrals these days that don't get filtered back to the internet in some way. They're going to look for a review. They're going to look for your website. They're going to try and find you. And if somebody else, when, when it, if somebody gives me a referral, and this just happens to me, and I'm going to use a pediatric um, example, because one of my kids needed to have, it was, go to an allergist because there's an allergic reaction to some food. Um, and our pediatrician said here, this is who we referred to the, to all of our people to go to. I'm, in, in the old days, maybe 10 years ago, I would have just taken that referral at face value mm -hmm. and gone to them. Now, guess where I went? Mm -hmm. I Googled, you know, the, who the best allergy doctors were in town. The one they recommended had terrible reviews. I'm not going to them. I went right. and they I basically, and their website was okay. The reviews were terrible. We ended up going to another doctor because those doctors weren't taking care of their own um, reputation management and their own website, right? And I think this happens over and over again. A lot of people will say most of our business comes from referrals, but what they don't really realize or admit is people don't get as much referral business as they think they get because they lose it when it filters back through the internet. So just because you got your last three you know, clients off of referrals doesn't mean that you lost seven of them because they couldn't find your or like somebody else what they found online. So being able to look at that and understand how important that is to every single business, because we're all internet businesses now, whether we like to be or not, um, I think is really important. So Changing that and getting that mindset and understanding that you have to tend to your website and nurture it, a big part of that is um, looking for, you said, like keywords, understanding how your ideal client search. And this is really important. There's lots of free ways to go out there and do this. You can go to Google AdWords. Of course, that's their paid platform. But within AdWords, there's a keyword planner tool that's free. Set up an account. Don't set up an AdWords campaign. Go in there. Use the keyword planner. They'll literally give you the um, the you can and you can pin it down to your location when you do this keyword planner. So you can go, okay, hey Kansas City, here's five root root keywords for dentist or Overland Park dentist or Kansas City dentist. Um, they will give you once you enter that information to the geography you're targeting and the root keywords you give them. They'll give you say another hundred or five hundred keywords in terms of the way people are actually searching for those. And they're giving you organic information, even though it's within AdWords, they're giving you organic keyword information because they want you to use that to create the best AdWords as you can. But within that AdWords paid platform, gold mine of keyword um, that you can, then once you know how people are searching, you know how to maybe go back to your website and make sure you're planting some of these keywords naturally into the pages, naturally into your blog posting, which we'll talk a little bit more because that's really important. And if you get a little bit under the hood, you know, being able to go up into your browser title, Mm -hmm. or your meta descriptions if people are familiar with like WordPress and Yoast, very simple tool to be able to go up there and, and naturally work mm -hmm. keywords into some, some of the more basic um, sections of your website. And just doing these little things a lot of times um, can uncork SEO by or significantly increase your ranking potential just because you've gone in and instead of, you know, there's a lot of people who go on their websites, again, digital brochure mentality, they actually like to have a captive audience. So they put the words that they would want to put on as they would present. But in search engine optimization, we want to look at the way people are searching and then naturally work that language in so we can pull people in. And sometimes the wording that you use is a lot different because you're a professional versus the way people actually search. So that's that's really important. Um, is to be able Just to go a quick in. question, Phil. When you say meta descriptions, can you explain what that is for our audience? So that mm -hmm. is if we do a Google search and you do a keyword search and you get a list of a bunch of organic results, 10 of them are going to be organically, three to four of them are going to be um, – in the maps results, and of course, you're going to get some ads. Down in that organic section, the blue line, the blue hot link line is your page title. 
So you can go into that page title into your back end and actually set that. A lot of websites out there, they don't have a page. Their page title up in the browser bar might just be home or the name of the company or the name of the practice. But that's a super huge opportunity. And one of the more heavily weighted ranking factors on page is to make sure that you have a browser title up in the top that actually has your primary keywords that actually sync up with the rest of the page. So you can't say you're Overland Park Dentist and not mention Overland Park Dentist on the page somewhere. Um, so a lot of people put your brand name up in there, but you also want to put some of those key keyword terms on the on your site. So that's the blue line. The meta description is the is the description that comes underneath the blue text title in an organic search on Google. So typically you're going to see you know, the highlighted link that you can click and a little bit of a gray descriptive text below that. You can actually tell Google what you want to put down in there. And Google doesn't actually count that those words as much, but they're really super important for click-through rates because the sexier, more attractive, or more targeted that message is in is usually the more of a better click-through rate you're going to get if you show up on the page. And interestingly enough, the higher your click-through rate is, the more that's a search engine ranking factor. So you can actually pull yourself up the page. If you manage to get yourself to the first page and all of a sudden people start going down and they see, oh, you've got a really attractive because you stay, you give free consultations or you've got something going on or you just have a better way to describe your business, um, that can really help bring up your click-through rate because you didn't just leave it to Google. You didn't set the meta description. You left it to Google to grab something randomly off the page that either doesn't make sense or maybe has the keyword in it. Um, so to the extent that you can actually tell Google what you want to put, if that search result is really powerful. So those are two things that a lot of people miss out on or they don't spend the time on that are or have a enormous amount of power for the amount of time and effort it takes to kind of set those and that's just one of those things to be disciplined about and make sure that you're you're looking at those and putting because you're a lot of people leave a lot of potential on the table just by not putting a little bit of thought into setting that browser title on that meta it's very easy to do it takes just a few moments to go through and if you have a wordpress website do your yoast seo but you have to know what keywords to use and what verbiage is going to have a good result and that sort of a thing. What would you say some of the most common tips are, and especially in our field where people are really solopreneurs and a lot of times they're trying to do a lot of DIY stuff. Um, like what are some of the, the common mistakes you see folks make? I think the biggest mistake is just people, they, if they do anything online, they'll set up a website and leave it static. And if they've got some good content or something to say, they put it up on a third party platform, like a social a network, a Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is. And it just goes up there once in real time, passes through the river and kind of dies there. That's not the way you want to market today. You want to put your best content on your website, share the link and make sure that they come back to your site and use that as a referral source for all of your content communication. When you do that, you can do things like set an AdWords remarketing tag or a Facebook pixel on there. You can start to collect audiences. Even if you don't want to like start marketing or paid marketing, you can start to collect information on your um or you can start to tag your visitors. So if you ever want to do a targeted campaign later, you're actually kind of building your website as an asset. So a lot of people, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes I see is they'll, they'll they kind of treat everything um, separately where they should really use their website as the hub and make sure that everything that they do, I think online and offline comes back to the website in some way, shape or form. So you've got some kind of call to action or some kind of um, something that's attractive. So you can all of a sudden get them into your education funnel and start nurturing them or collect the information so that you can market to them later. Um, then you've got, if you think about it, if you start doing it this way, you can just, for not a lot of effort, you can all of a sudden build up an audience of hundreds or even thousands of people. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, I want to do a Facebook campaign. Well, I've been doing the pixel for a long time. Now I got an, an, an audience built in and I can start doing this right off the bat. So that's the biggest thing. The second thing really kind of gets into where I think. So anybody, Phil, before, before you oh, yeah. share the second thing, I know that a lot of times this is just general conversation for you and we know what a pixel is. <laughs> if you can share what a, what a pixel is. People might be thinking like, is that the like type of drawing, the dots? No, no. <laughs> what is a pixel so there's lots of different things you can be doing to actually put um code on your website that when somebody lands on it you can tag them and then almost kind of build up your own database um so that you can market to people there now facebook's got their own special code or tagging system that they call a facebook pixel and if you've got a facebook account you can go on there and for free set up a little snippet of code it's called your pixel and then literally take that and install it very easily on your WordPress website so that anybody that comes to your website 
they will get tagged with this pixel that's, that's associated with your account online. And then when you want to do some more advertising later, you'll actually have a built-in audience of people that have visited your website. So they're highly targeted because they've already been there at some point. And again, you can start to accumulate these visitors in a way where you can retarget them. The same thing happens with AdWords. AdWords had ones called the, their remarketing tag. So if you see people that actually do these kind of lower cost um, display campaigns, that target and stalk you in other places online, it's because they tagged you with their version of this tag. And again, you collected it in your AdWords account. And at some point, maybe you want to do a display or a banner ad so that somebody came back to your website. You can do those kind of stalker ads. Maybe not the best way to describe them. Probably not. <laughs> but something that can follow them around and kind yeah, of be... Um, and I'm sure, yeah, I know there's certain, um, there's certain restrictions. I know that I've got a bankruptcy attorney and they can't retarget in that market because of there's privacy concerns because somebody came in. They don't want to show if somebody comes down and sits under a computer again that there's been bankruptcy searches. So I'm sure that applies to certain types of medical fields as well. But Google will tell you. I mean, they just all of a sudden say you're not eligible because, you know, it's this type of an ad. But still, it can't hurt you from using the tag and collecting the data and trying to, to, um, to, to have that if you can use it later. So, again, these are these, this is a simple thing everybody can be doing for free. <laughs> Basically, if you've got that mentality of, hey, my website's my marketing hub, let's make sure that everything we're doing comes back there, and then we're tracking people um, and being able to use that and bank that information for later. And so, if, you, if you're not doing your own website and you're having somebody else do it, your web developer or company can easily set that up for you. Right. And so I know we're running out of time, but Phil, if you could maybe give maybe just three more like tips or resources for SEO, you give us the Google AdWords, the keyword planner tool, you gave us the Google search educator guidelines, cheat sheet, anything else up your sleeve that you are my like must have tools? The, yeah, I'm going to run. This is my biggest bang for the buck that anybody can do to get a lot more clients quickly. And that is you can set your website set up, come up with, um, commit to a blogging strategy. Your blogging strategy, think of doing them in terms of 10 to 15 posts each time. And get, you're not, most people just aren't going to write 10 or 15 posts. You're going to have to find, uh, especially a, a solopreneur or a small business, has to find an outsource writing person, freelancer, somebody to at least help them. They get some coaching, write it up. You can edit it and do it this way. But the idea is to write 10 to 15 blog posts at a time. Just come up with the titles. And when you do this, you want to do it that, so that the, um, the 10 or 15 is written in almost like a series, like a table of contents. How to hire. It's, then what you do at the end, so you've got a standalone blog post for each week. At the end of the 10 or 15 weeks, you stitch them together into an ebook. The ebook then turns into a call to action on your website where you can collect emails. But more importantly, for very cheaply, you can then um, spin that uh, PDF into a Kindle put the Kindle up on Amazon, become an author and leverage and get backlinks from Amazon. Now all of a sudden we're working on your personal branding and you as an authority that e comes back to that EAT education, authority, and trust. You're becoming a published author. You're up on Amazon. They see a book on your website. One of the things that we've done for some clients now, since I've been doing podcast think guesting is you can actually then take that ebook and use it as a way to start getting yourself guested on other people's podcasts. Now, this has been the most powerful thing I've done in 12 years of business. I've gotten so much business off of podcast guesting, so much great, the best form of uh, organic SEO backlinks that you can get. Plus, I've been able to leverage other people's audiences. There's this cross. I mean, you guys know all the benefits in terms of doing this. The guests and the host cross, you know, use their social channels. Um, and sometimes people, I can't remember if you guys on your website, if you use your transcripts. We don't. You don't. So what I've done, people that don't use them, I ask the hosts, like I ask you, is do you mind if I transcribe the at my cost? I then take that, turn that into a blog post, put it on my website, and give the host links back from my website that's done to so I get a free blog post out of this, right? Nice. Very smart. But then long long form blog posts they end up being like six to eight thousand words. My, the guests that I'm on obviously get the benefit of having that rank getting and getting links later and the show that I was on then all of a sudden gets a second round of launch because obviously you launch it first and then we would do it later type of thing. You do this pattern where you start, just start with your website, blog, do a series, 
you're taking care of your your you're taking care of your on page SEO. You're building your website up. You're targeting keywords. You're working on your personal branding and your authorship by spinning into an ebook. You've got a call to action to collect emails. Put it up on Amazon and Kindle. Get backlinks from them. Become an author on your own author page. Now all of a sudden, maybe start doing a guesting campaign. You can hire a booking agency. Some of these you can do by yourself. If you're right, you can go out and just. There's, there's a lot of podcasts out there that it's hard to get on, but there's a ton of them out there that are great and have their own little pockets. Of, um, and it doesn't matter if they've got 50 or 500 or 50,000 listeners. I mean, each one of those is a great opportunity, and there's a way for you to kind of micro-niche and, again, build yourself up as an authority, have other people say that you're an expert, you're coming on as an expert. And a lot of times the show notes, it's all about you. So a lot of times people are going out with, with SEO and trying to get backlinks now. They're trying to do it in terms of guest posting. It's a pain in the butt. Thousand word blog posts, they get rejected all the time. They're spammy. You might get one backlink that helps you out. But on somebody else's podcast, you're getting a whole show notes page about you. You know what I mean? Quickest way to build authority for anybody anywhere. And so I've been telling people, I've been doing this for 12 years. I've never seen any single tactic that when you do it this way, it has this much bang for the buck. The final thing that I'll tell you on this, I want to get back to reviews, is I've been going out on every show. And then saying, hey, here's my review funnel. Will you rate me in terms of a guest on my show? I've been sending them back to my Google page. i gotten more than 50 reviews off of this on my Google account that's then helped launch me locally for my own business. Just just that alone has been worth every penny of this. But if you take all the other benefits I've got along the way where you can just kind of aggregate these all together, super, super powerful. Again, it all comes back to kind of like blogging and just stretching it out. And you do it once. This is the way people can build their authority, get all sorts of SEO stuff, and actually leverage other people's audience in a way that can really help grow and actually get clients out of it. I I will finish with saying that I've at least gotten $100,000 in new business last year from podcast guesting. And that's not even, that's just gravy for me because that was, and it's probably going to lead to another $100,000 this year at least. Um, But I wasn't even thinking about doing that kind of stuff for clients. I was more thinking about what's the easiest way I can get natural backlinks back to my website. That's how I started. And I was like, holy cow, look at all these things. It's like raining down with benefits. And I think this can, this strategy can work for every business and especially practitioners that where it really helps to be able to become and be perceived as an expert in your area, because that's what people, who people want to go to. Right. Great, great tips. And it's interesting. I kind of, I didn't expect it, us to focus so much on reviews and the idea of podcasting and things like that, but you're right. You can put these things and you should, if you've been on a podcast talking about a specific area as a therapist, put that video, put that podcast on because it's a way for people to get to know you without even ever stepping in the door and they get connected to you and then they even feel better. It's like, you know, it's, there's a big difference. I've been on YouTube looking for videos or something like that. And I keep getting the the ads for Grammarly and then the ad change where it actually demonstrated someone using Grammarly. And then all of a sudden I was like, Oh my gosh, like I think I might use this because it actually looks better than what I perceived it. So yeah, you come to a website and it's about you or about your services, but if they hear you talking or doing a video, they're like, this person really could help me. They just did a demo. So Phil, you've been really fantastic. Thank you so much. It sounds like we could probably talk about this for hours. I know. And I'm putting up with my rant. It feels like I'm trying to get so much out, so oh, much out. <laughs> well, clearly, SEO yeah. is one of those things where there's just so many things going in, but you got to try and boil it down for people can actually say, yeah, I, I, I get that. I could actually do that. And hopefully there's a few things that we said today where, where people are inspired to do so. Yeah, it was a really value-packed podcast and clearly you're really passionate about it and you're all amped up talking about these things and you've inspired new thoughts for me and I appreciate that too. So yeah, it's been great having you on today. And we know that you have a giveaway for our guests. What is the giveaway? Yeah, head on over to kcseopro.com forward slash just on my contact page. I've got a local SEO book that's chock full of some of the things that we're talking about today. And there are also some specifics in there about how you might just be able to apply some of these DIY to your your current website. Of course, a lot of what we do is WordPress, but thankfully most people, that's what most people are using today. So, Yeah. And so you can also head over to our show notes page and we'll have all the links that Phil had talked about and more because he sent us a whole bunch. Um, so that will just be a place where you can get everything and you just go to privatepracticestartup.com, head over to the podcast tab and search for the podcast episodes. Um, so Phil, thanks again so much for being on our show. Um, we really appreciate it. And Startup Nation, we hope you had a blast on today's show. I don't know. Sometimes SEO might be like one of those things like you're like, I got a headache. I don't know ah, my head. But hopefully, like Kate said, that you've been inspired by at least even one tip. If you take and apply one tip that you've heard from today's show, whether it's get more reviews from your colleagues, whether it's be on a guest 
podcast and or post a podcast on your page or video, you know, that really makes all the difference is, is starting. I love the series idea for the blog, creating a, a, an ebook. That was brilliant for me. That was my inspirational tool. Um, so make sure to check out those show notes where all those tips, resources, giveaways, and links from today's show are waiting for you there. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. Share your show, share the show with friends and fellow colleagues. And we hope you've had a great day and continue to have a great day. And we appreciate the opportunity to continue inspiring you from startup to mastery. See you later, Startup Nation. See you next time. Thanks for joining us on The Private Practice Startup. Visit theprivatepracticestartup.com for awesome resources, free trainings, attorney-approved private practice paperwork, and so much more. 